Hey, so uh, just a few notes about the exam, Monday's exam, before going back to material. By now, you should have gotten the e my email with your score on it. Uh, there are a few people who took the, ex the exam elsewhere for whom this doesn't apply, but all of you who took the exam in this room, your exam booklets are, at least were out in the hall on these literature recs, alphabetized by last name. So I encourage you to get your exam booklet. It's going to be different from everybody else's. And I emailed you what your choices were on your booklet and what the correct answers were on your booklet. Alternatively, you can just simply go online and look at the, uh, the solutions which are posted up there. The, the exam itself and the solutions to the exam are right there. Um, I, on the posted solutions, I fixed the typo with the twice for, should have been a half. Um, Sorry about the typo. Uh, what else? You know, like, ah! <laughs> yeah, it happens periodically. Uh, the worst possible typo that happened many years ago. OK, I'll tell you, because it's fun. I, I, you, you notice all exams were different, right? Every, literally every exam in this room was a different exam. I, 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 I scrambled them and print them individually. But there was a time when I made 17 master copies, and I handed them out alternately. Where and one time I forgot to scramble one of the master copies. Consequently, set one seventeenth of the students sitting in this room received an exam for which the right answer was always A. <laughs> Interestingly, a good fraction of the people who had that exam did not figure it out. They didn't know the material well enough. But I had at least one student who was you know, really good, really on the ball, sitting about there where is, uh, who was just in tears. They're all A. <laughs> <laughs> it was, it was. <sighs> and she showed it to me, and I, and I said, well, that's statistically possible, because I was using a random number generator and stuff, like, not for like 30 or 60 questions. I was like, no, this isn't an accident. <laughs> not, it's not a, this is not a statistical fluke. This is a me messed up. Anyhow. So I'm sorry about the typo. Um, I will try. I will try to post my discussions of the answers at some point, uh, as ideally as videos. It's just trying to get the time to do it right, the enthusiasm to, to do it. Any any questions, issues related to the exam? I, I do actually. I, I should. What I should say is, is the 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 scores covered the whole gambit from from perfect to, uh, to, to random guessing. It's only 15% of the grade. The fact that it's spread out so widely means it's a relatively influential 15% of the grade, as opposed to things where everybody gets the same score. But for the people who did really well, great. However, it's only a quarter of the exam scores. So the, the you know, good news is you did well. The bad news is it's not, you know, it's not sufficient. There's lots to go. For the people who didn't do as well as they would have liked, good news, bad news. I mean, the, or the bad news is that, well, you didn't do as well as you'd like and stuff. The good news is there's a lot of opportunity to remedy this. However, in both cases, well, particularly for people who, who want to do better, it requires a change. That is, you, you can't just like hope to do better next time. If you want to do better, you actually have to learn from your mistakes and, and sort of figure out what the issues are. And I'm happy to talk with you about them uh, and try to figure it out. But people tend to repeat. So, so without working at it, you'll, you'll, you'll likely do the same thing on the next exam. Is that OK? I mean, not OK. I mean, it's like, <laughs> does that make sense? All right? Any other questions? OK. So. Back to, 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 to the physics content. So t I'm talking about bicycles. And as I said in, in introducing the whole topic, my, the thing that, that stares me in the face with respect to bicycles is, is the issues of stability. We ride bicycles as adults. We ride tricycles as kids. And so, so why the, the, the migration from, from tricycles to bicycles? And it has a lot to do with stability. And there are sort of two issues, of two, two types of stability. There are things that are stable at rest, static stability, when things aren't happening. Uh, and then there's stability in motion. And the stability, dynamic stability. 
And dynamic stability sh shows up in bicycles. It shows up in, in, in zillions of things. And the trade-offs that, that come with respect to the stability, what, what I call dynamic stability for bicycles, they show up in, in many other contexts. Um, stability in airplanes, for example. So just to sort of reiterate the story for stability at rest, and from talking to people in office hours and stuff, I, I you know, sort of pull up ideas that we came up with there, and that is, the big picture, set aside bicycles, set aside bases of support and stuff, the big picture for a system that is stable at rest is, first of all, that it have an equilibrium, which this room has right now. Equilibrium is when the, blue, the uh, broom is right below the support, which is my hand right now. It's at equilibrium, zero net force. It's not accelerating, it's not rotationally accelerating either. It's happy as a clam. And if I disturb this baby and let go, it tries to go back. Influences, where influences are forces or torques or some mixture of the two, appear when you disturb it that push it back towards the equilibrium. So this is the equilibrium, zero net force, zero net torque. And we take it away, and, you know, it, but we bother it, things show up that push it back. Is that okay with everybody? Or questions about that idea? Why, why, why do those things show up to push it back? And it goes back to the, to the observation I made about, this, well, the sixth topic back in the world of bumper cars, that objects accelerate in the direction that reduces their total potential energy as quickly as possible. If you take that observation to heart, and it, it, then this makes sense. Right now, the, low, the broom has gravitational potential energy. That's pretty much the only potential energy it has. And its potential energy right now is as low as it can get, given that I'm going to hold it here until my arm gives out. But it can't, go, it can't lower its gravitational potential energy anymore while I'm holding it. Any disturbance will raise its gravitational potential energy. It will lift it upward. It's basically its center of mass. Ah, gravity, which is right around here. The effective location of its weight is as low as it can be in altitude. And any disturbance raises its altitude. And with it, the total potential energy. Questions about that idea? So this arrangement is the minimum of total potential energy for this broom. It can't reduce its total potential energy any lower than this. And any disturbance of this thing will raise its total potential energy, and it will accelerate back towards the lowest. It's trying to get rid of total potential, total potential energy. You should have seen me during my sister's wedding when we were supposed to do rap. You know how you know how people get up and, and give, and, and say silly stuff at people's weddings and stuff, and so all the cousins were going to do rap, and it came to me. It was it was a bloodbath. So this thing accelerates so as to reduce its total potential energy. Is that okay with everybody? Everybody, yeah. This this now is another uh, equilibrium. Center, center of uh, gravity is here over my hand. If I get it just lined up just right, it's at equilibrium, zero net force. But if we disturb this, influences show up that push it away from the equilibrium. Why? Because this arrangement is a maximum of total potential energy. This is as high as the total potential energy can get without me moving my hand down, you know, changing the pivot. So. It's at a maximum total potential energy. Any disturbance allows it to accelerate in the direction that further reduces its total potential energy, and over it goes. It's trying, again, to get rid of total potential energy. So things that are in the arrangements where, this, where a bunch of stuff is at its lowest possible total potential energy, that's going to be at a stable equilibrium. Arrangements where the bunch of stuff is at the maximum possible total potential energy, that's going to be an unstable equilibrium, one to which you will not return when you bump it. Any questions about that? 
All right, so the world's full of these things that have stable or unstable equilibria. Um, you know, all the hanging things, chandeliers. So th things that are hanging tend to, to, to settle into stable equilibria. It's really easy to come up with one, a hanging chandelier. So almost anything dr drifting down. Even a bicycle, come to think of it, a bicycle, just to bring, th bring it back to this, this story, when it's upright, it's in an unstable equilibrium. Why? Because its center of gravity is as high as possible when it's perfectly upright, and therefore it's at a maximum of total potential energy. If you bother it, it falls over. But what if you take it home and you hang it from the hooks on the ceiling, right? Some of you have seen this happening. Then it's a hanging object. It goes into a stable equilibrium. It, it, it settles so it's managed to reduce its total potential energy to the minimum, and it sits there. Is it OK? All right, well, that's the big picture idea. St stable and unstable equilibria correspond to minima and maxima of total potential energy. Hopefully the words minima and maxima mean something to you. Uh, special cases, then. A tricycle. And I don't have a tricycle again, so I'll go grab my the chair. This manages my four, my four non-wheeled tricycle. It manages to be in a stable equilibrium because when the, f the four legs are touching the ground and our combined center of gravity is above the square described by that four contact points, when it's vertically above that, we are at a max, ah, sorry, minimum of total potential energy. Any tip that we make, bicycle and me, tricycle and me, uh, any tip that we make will raise our center of gravity. This is just a geometry issue. You just play with geometry, you realize, oh, it goes up. It will raise our center of gravity and therefore raise our total potential energy. We will accelerate so as to reduce our total potential energy as quickly as possible, and we will go back to upright equilibrium. Is that okay? And many things use this, this trick of having a, a base of support described by the contact points with the ground and putting the center of gravity above, vertically above that base. Incidentally, that arrangement works whether the base is, is on a level ground or tilted ground. It's still it's still perfectly functional concept. So when you're driving a car on a hill, and I talked a little about this last time. As long as the four contact points that are made by the wheels to the ground, and, and therefore describe a tilted square or a rectangle, as long as the center of gravity is vertically above that, that uh, rectangle, you're still statically stable. You're in an equilibrium to which you will return if something jostles the car. But if the, thing, if the hill gets, uh, the, the slope gets too steep, or your car is designed so you're, you, you're, you're driving giraffes in your, in your car with the sunroof open and the giraffes way out there, taking the center of gravity way high in the car. Then a little tilt will take the center of gravity, which is way up there near the giraffe's neck, will take it so that vertically it's no longer above that square. You tip over. So, so very tall vehicles are in danger of tipping over if you go on an uneven ground. And that's why, yeah, very, it's not a great idea to, to raise your vehicle just for fun. It makes it potentially unstable even at rest. All right, so any questions about why a tricycle is stable? At re I should say, at stable at rest. Bicycle, not so, because it doesn't have any base of support, if you like. It's just a line. And as long as the center of gravity is above that line, fine, you're, you're in an e equilibrium, but it's an unstable one. Any tilt to the side, and over it goes. Yeah, Savannah. Would it matter if the tires were really thick? You're right. The tires are thick enough, and they actually uh, make a lot of contact. So, so instead of having rounded tires like a typical bicycle, you had a, a wide, flat surface cylinder, cylindrical tire. Then it, then it now it has a base of support. It's not a very wide one, but, but it's there. And so, so in principle, you could make a bicycle that would, 
that would uh, stand up on its own. That comes at a cost. Now it's hard to tip the bicycle, which is something that turns out to be very important when you're moving. If you don't tip the bicycle while you're turning, you will crash. And then you have discovered if, you, if you've driven a bicycle. So it's, you, you, you get trade-offs. Other questions? Yeah. If, 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 the, 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 if the chair's on the edge of the base of support, if, if the question is, if, if I begin to tilt here until, I, until my, our combined center of gravity is right over that edge, then we're still in equilibrium. But if, we, if you tilt us the slightest bit towards you all, then we will, be, we will drift outside the base of support. And forces will start showing up that will tip us further, we'll fall over. So there's just, there's an edge. And, and you've seen stuff that was right up there against the edge. And it's, ah, is it going to fall over? Ah, and it, it does or doesn't. Is that OK? Uh, one, one other observation, actually, about bicycles. Uh, Kickstands, which I haven't had since I was a kid, because they were no self-respecting bicycles would have a kickstand on their fancy bike. But what the kickstand does for you is it provides a third contact point with the ground when you click it down. And now you've got a base of support, a real one. And as long as the center of gravity the, of the bicycle is above that little triangle, you're good. But those of you who play with kickstands and bicycles with kickstands, it's a little tricky. Sometimes you, that, it's, a t it's not a much, there's not a lot of uh, area in that triangle with the kickstand. And therefore, if you don't have it set up right or if the ground's sloping and stuff, it's pretty easy for the center of gravity of the bicycle to drift so it's no longer vertically above that triangle and over you go. All right. So then, why do we ride bicycles? And so here's the story. When you're, when it, when you're a kid and you have a tricycle, when you're, you're, pretty, when you're little, you spend a lot of time at rest. You're just sort of sitting on the, on the tricycle. It's more like a moving chair for, for, for a lot of kids. But the most fun thing to do with a tricycle, the last thing to do with a tricycle, you know, is to ride it down a hill, right, with your feet off the pedals. Wow, we're going fast, going fast, going fast. Oh, there is a tree or a fence. Make a sharp left or right turn. And I know there are people in this room who have done this, and they have gone to the emergency room for, for damage to their chin. Is this familiar to people? You know, okay, I'm, I'm abbreviating the story. But you, those of you who have had this happen know it. When you make that sharp turn at high speed, the forces that are exerted to make, on, on the tricycle to make it turn, and that is to accelerate, say, to the left, are exerted at the, at the ground by friction. They affect the the tricycle very nicely. They do not affect you nearly so much. You tend to go inertial. And so the, the kid on the tricycle tends to go straight while the tricycle turns. And it, it leaves the kid behind to land on their chin. That's the, that's the chin, chin injury problem. And I, I'm sure there are a couple people here who have, that, have had that experience of s stopping their forward motion with their chin. So. The problem with vehicles that cannot tip, which is the case for a tricycle, is they're, 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 they can be not wonderfully stable at rest. But in motion, they are prone to tipping over because of inertial effects. They, the, the upper parts of the vehicle, which includes the rider you often, tends to go straight while the vehicle does the turning without them. Does that make sense? You can picture it? You surely have seen this happen. What's the, what is sort of the, technically the problem here is that, and you can look at it so many different ways, all of which are equivalent, but they superficially they, they look differently, that when, the, when we'll, we'll be riding the tricycle, we're, here we are, we're all riding along, we're going to make a hard left turn. The force that, that causes that, that turn acts low. And it, you can think of it as acting low at a lever arm relative to the overall center of mass, the rope, pivot, the natural pivot, it acts low down there, and it tends to push, to, to produce a torque about that pivot that causes, from your perspective, 
clockwise rotation, clockwise angular acceleration. So, so that the kid's head rotates right while the bicycle rotates toward the left. And they, they're no longer above each other, and pretty soon static stability can't help them. Static stability fights this tipping over problem, but it doesn't, it, if, if, the, if the rotation effects are too severe, even static stability can't save you. You, you, you go over anyway. All right, so it's, it's, the, it's mostly an inertial effect. The stuff up here just goes straight. The, the stuff down below drives out from under it. What's the solution? Uh, the solution is to allow the vehicle to tip. Don't have three wheels, have two. And what a bicycle does, you know, we, talk, we, we already did this. If you raise the height of a sports utility vehicle, how does that affect its turning stability? Well, it makes it worse. And uh, you all got that. And the, a way to think about this is the higher the center of mass and center of gravity of the vehicle is, the harder it is to prevent that high stuff from traveling inertially. And so it makes it, it, makes it easier for the, the lower part of the vehicle to drive out from underneath the stuff that's way up high. Uh, that's a perfectly decent way of thinking about the problem. So you don't want vehicles that have a very high center of mass and center of gravity. The, the, the lower part of the vehicle runs too much of a risk of driving out from underneath that stuff. All right? May look cool, but not uh, very viable. OK, so what about a bicycle? Well, my question in this was, and I showed you last time, but let's, let, I'll ask it now as a question, is to balance a broom on your hand, which you can do, it's not, you know, not, not very hard, you look at one point. Um, it, to, you know, to do it decently. What point do you want to look at? And uh, we've got A, B, C, and D. You got How many think you want to look at your hand? This. Yeah, not, not very good. How about the top of the broom? Okay. How about the broom's center of gravity? Okay. And how about the middle of the broom? Okay. Uh, the majority is going for the center of gravity, and that's actually the right place to look. Because the issue you have in mind, what you're really trying to do, is you're trying to return the broom to its unstable equilibrium. By itself, the broom can't fix the problem. The unstable equi equilibrium exists. It's a maximum of total potential energy with the slightest disturbance, and it never goes back. It, it influences show up that push it away. It's gone. What you want to do is keep returning it to its unstable equilibrium, and that corresponds to the arrangement where the support is directly below the center of gravity. You want those two to be vertically aligned. That's the point of maximum total potential energy, and therefore the unstable equilibrium. So I look at the center of gravity, which is right around here, and I keep on putting my hand under it. That fixes the problem. All right? And that's what a bicycle does when you're riding it. And I'll come back shortly to how it does that. But when you're heading forward on a bicycle, it's built into its design is a tendency to steer itself so that it keeps driving underneath your center of gravity. So even as you begin to fall over, it fixes it. It goes, oh, you're over on the right side. We'll steer right and get underneath you again and fix it. And it does that all endlessly, fixing and fixing and fixing, returning you to the unstable equilibrium. The issue that I, that I really have at hand, though, is, is I, I claim that the being able to tip the vehicle allows you to avoid the crash, the inertial crash problem when you're turning. So that on a tricycle, when you're heading away, and you know, okay, well, you can stare at my back for a second. So if this were a tricycle, and you're staring at my back, but whatever, and I make a sudden left turn, I can't tilt the, the tricycle at all. So I make the left turn. The, the tri the, suddenly, the ground, by way of friction, pushes the, the, uh, bi the tricycle wheels to the left, and over we go. I crash over here on the right side of the, of the tricycle. Is that OK there, everybody? On a bicycle, I can do two things at once. Not only can I, I can turn, but I also can lean. If I make the bicycle tilt this way, which is a, a story of its own, if I tilt it like this, and if that's all I do, I'm going to fall over. 
because, of, uh, because it's an, uh, it, it has left an unstable equilibrium, I'm going to fall over to the left. Right? So if I lean without turning, that is, I just, for, for foolish reasons, tilt the bicycle to the, so that the top is toward the left, I'm going to fall over toward the left. Right? So leaning without turning causes a disaster toward the inside of the, toward the left in this case. If, on the other hand, I turn without leaning, I fall over to the right. Because inertia makes me continue and the bicycle leaves me behind. Those are in opposite directions. So leaning without turning causes a, a crash to one side, and turning without leaning causes a crash to the other side. Do them both at once. They can cancel each other. So if I lean and turn, I can stay upright. And that's what you do. You lean just the right amount so that your tendency to fall over in the direction of your lean cancels your tendency to fall over uh, opposite the direction of your turn. And they cancel and you stay upright. So bicyclists, you, you watch, watch bicyclists, runners, anything that is traveling in a, uh, that is traveling in a bent path. Yeah. Here, has to has to, to to lean while they turn. Otherwise, the inertial problem causes it comes and gets them. So, watch runners uh, going around a, a track at high speed. They'll they'll lean towards the inside of the turn so that they don't tip over. That they're again they're balancing these two effects: the tendency to go inertial with the tendency to fall over because of the lean, and they get the balance. Bicycle, same thing. Motorcyclists, same thing. You see, motorcyclists, they'll, they'll take turns so hard in a race, for example, that they're almost uh, touched, well, they, they may even touch the ground. They're tipped so tightly over. Uh, there's a reason why people wear leather pants and stuff like that. So it's to leave behind, uh, it's one thing to leave behind leather, it's another thing to leave behind your, your, uh, your own knee. Not so fun. Questions about this idea? The leaning while you're turning. All right. Um, okay. So tricycles obviously can't lean during the turns. They they can't fix the inertial problem. A, 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 a acceleration to the side that's too aggressive will cause the tricycle to crash every time. Whereas a two-wheeled vehicle that is able to lean can fix this tipping over problem. In principle. Uh, they can accelerate as hard as they like. They have to tip farther and farther to do it. There will ultimately come a point where they just can't get enough grip on the pavement to pull it off, but to, to turn that aggressively. But within that range of, of what's, what's realistic, they can turn as hard as they like without flipping. And that's why we, we ride bicycles, is so as to avoid the inertial crash problem. Well, that leaves me then, last thing to talk about then, is I claimed that the bicycle has automatic steering that fixes the problems whenever you begin to tip over undesirably. I mean, there's tipping when you're turning, which you do, uh, cor it's a correct choice and you do it deliberately. It involves steering in the wrong direction briefly. It's, it's, a, it, it's, it's a complicated story, but you, you actually do manage to, to force the bicycle to begin leaning in the appropriate direction in order to complete the turn, safe, the turn safely. And you pull it out of the, out of the lean at the end of the turn uh, it becomes second nature. This is part of learning how to ride a bicycle, which you never forget in principle, right? So how about the issue of what happens if the bicycle leans by accident while you're not turning? Isn't this death and destruction? Well, the answer is no, and it's no for two interesting reasons. One is the bicycle has two major parts that move somewhat independently. It's not a single rigid two-wheeled thing. It has a steering axis, ooh, right? And the design of the steering axis is such that when it's perfectly upright, there is no tendency for the bicycle to begin to pivot a, its steering axis. But if you lean the bicycle, watch what happens. If I make the bicycle lean towards you, the front wheel pivoted. I didn't do that. I mean, it happens automatically. It always happens. I'll let you watch. 
from behind. It happens so that if you lean to the right, it steers to the right. And if you lean to the left, it steers to the left. That's no accident. Well, initially it was probably when people first designed the bicycles, they may not have thought about this, and they got lucky, and that's probably the case. But in retrospect, they had to do this. What, if, what happens? Whenever you begin to lean to the right, you're in danger of falling over to the right. The wheels should do their best to drive themselves underneath your center of gravity, which involves driving toward the right, because your, your center of gravity has drifted to the right. The bicycle better go over there and get you. And ooh, it steers in the correct direction to go rescue you. Right? When it goes forward, it, it, go, it comes underneath your center of gravity. Steer left, it, comes, it drives to the left to go, go rescue you, all automatically. Why does it steer? It steers because of this principle that objects accelerate in the direction that reduces their total potential energy as quickly as possible. When you tilt the bicycle, it can lower its center of gravity a little bit by pivoting the front wheel the way you just did. That's actually the result of the bicycle trying to reduce its total potential energy. It, that pivot lowers the bicycle a little tiny bit. And it's designed that way. It is possible to design a bicycle that tilts, that, that pivots the wrong way. And those bicycles, people have tried it, they're unrideable. You can't go any distance without crashing um, because they don't spontaneously rescue you. They anti-rescue you. You begin to tip and they actually go the wrong way and, and make it worse. Okay, so, so any bicycle worth its salt steers the right way, rescues you. And children's bicycles are designed to, to steer more aggressively in that direction. They're, ex they're extremely stable. As a result, they're particularly easy to ride, no hands. Uh, as you get more sophisticated, responsive sports bicycles, they, are less, they're, they have less of that automatic steering. And that, therefore, they do a less good job of rescuing you automatically. And you may not be able to ride them, no hands. On the other hand, they can turn on a dime in a way that a, children's, a child's bike can't. And this is a general rule uh, for, for civility issues. Vehicles that are extremely stable in various ways are typically not very easily maneuvered. You don't get both. You don't get a super maneuverable vehicle that is also extremely stable against it, uh, uh, <laughs> perturbations, against things that you didn't want. Uh, this is true, for example, of airplanes. Very stable airplanes, ones that fly straight and true really easily. You can take your hands off the steering stuff and, and it, it goes straight and true, life is easy. They are not highly maneuverable, so they're not like stunt planes. So you want a stunt plane, you have to give up that super uh, stability. And you have to, they're harder to fly. Uh, this is surely true of, you know, of skis, of, you know, almost all kinds of sports equipment. The, the easier, the more maneuverable you want, the less stable you get, and vice versa. All right? There's one other effect that contributes to this automatic steering. You've seen the one that's associated with that natural pivoting of the steering column to lower the total potential energy. The other effect is one that has to do with the rotation of the front wheel. And so it's known as a, it's a gyroscopic effect. And gyroscopes are our name, the, the name for, for just a spinning wheel that is supported in some sort of housing and has some interesting to watch effects. So if we take the front wheel off a bicycle, we get something approximately like this. It turns out this wheel all by itself has an automatic steering effect. It doesn't need the whole bicycle to do it. It knows how to steer itself to stay upright. And if I put the bicycle wheel here and just let go, you know, it tips over pretty easily. But if I roll it forward, yeah, if I aim, if I roll it forward, it will automatically steer itself. Still can't drive very well. Come on, I want to get across the room at least once. You know, look at how wobbly on it. It looks horrible, and yet it managed to go the whole length of the room. And it, if the room were bigger, and if, if I were in a basketball arena or something like that, we could, we could get it all the way across the entire place. 
It's, it's constantly steering itself during that entire trip. It kept steering under its own center of mass, uh, center of gravity, to fix its tendency to tip over. Why was it steering like that? It turns out it's steering like that because of an effect known as precession, which has to do with rotating objects and angular momentum. So I'm going to pack this thing full of angular momentum. And the angular momentum, as I put it in, is going to be away from you. Remember that, that rule? Let me get a lot in there. And then I'm going to subject it to the twists that it would experience if it were on the floor and slightly tilted. But rather than put it on the floor slightly tilted, in which case it's going to run out of our view in a, in a, in a <laughs> less than a second, it's going to hit the wall and, and we can laugh, but it won't be very instructive. I'm not going to let the ground exert torques on it about its own natural pivot. I'm going to let a string exert a torque on it imitating the ground, but it's going to be pulling from above rather than pushing from below. So I'm going to, so here's the wheel. It's full of angular momentum away from you, and it's, it's steering all by itself. This string is exerting a torque on the wheel. It's pulling up on the wheel about its center of, of mass, and that upward pull uh, transfers angular momentum to it. And the, it's transferring angular momentum to this thing in a direction that's at right angles to its, its, the actual angular momentum it has. It, this is a complicated effect, one that I don't expect you guys to, to, to fully understand. Or, I mean, hopefully you get a piece of it. But this has got angular momentum in it w along one direction, and the string is transferring additional angular momentum to it at right angles. And what that does is it causes the angular momentum to shift from, from the direction it started in gradually around the horizontal directions. And it's trying them all. And each time it turns a little bit, it gets uh, the, the effect causes it to keep turning around. So the wheel is steering itself because of this torque. And the torque, OK, it's being exerted by an upward pulling string. It could be exerted by an upward pushing ground on the wheel itself while you're moving, and you get this effect. Again, it's called precession. It's part of the fun and games with gyroscopes. Uh, the bouncing you're seeing here is a, another piece of that story. It's called nutation, and it shows up in gyroscopes too. Um, but the main one is just that, that, that natural pivoting of the wheel when you twist it certain ways. Is that OK? Uh, I guess, in principle, a, a unicycle has a little bit of this effect in it. Actually, it probably, a unicycle probably is made easier to, to ride by, by this precession effect. It, should, it should, be, should be there. Obviously, a unicycle does not have much else in the way of stability. It's mostly a disaster. It requires uh, considerable skill to do it. We watched a race of a bunch of kids you know, th this high riding on mountain. They were riding unicycles on mountains. <laughs> And it was a race. I couldn't believe it. These guys were so good. Hi, I'm going 30 miles an hour on a single wheel, and it's down a cliff. All right. Whew. So that's bicycles. Any, any questions about bicycles? All right. I have time to do decent damage to rockets. Rockets is actually a very simple story. And so let me get into them. This brings up the, 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 the whole story in nutshells. If there were no launch pad underneath a, 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 a okay, NASA rocket, but these days it's you know, SpaceX or, or Blue, whatever, Blue, um, all, all these commercial rockets, get rid of the launch pad. So the, so the rocket starts sort of suspended. How would that affect? The, the thrust, the push provided by the engines of that rocket. You OK with the question? How many think that, that the, the push of the engines would basically be unaffected? How many think that the push would be approximately half? And finally, how about there'd be no push, zero? 
Okay, so it, it's, it's pretty spread among, the, among those who are voting. Uh, a lot of undecideds. Um, it turns out, okay, the answer is, it's, it's be pretty much unchanged. The issue with a rocket isn't having the plume of whatever coming out of the engine hit something. It's simply the act of throwing the stuff out the, out the back of the engine in the first place. So if you picture a rocket with this big torch shooting out the back, who cares where that torch goes? I mean, it, you don't want to be there, but, but it doesn't matter. The issue is the act of throwing the stuff out in the first place that causes the thrust to develop to push this, the rocket forward. And so I've got a bunch of demonstrations to show you this. Uh, before I do that, let me, let me uh, go through a few of the is issues just to lead in. I mean, obviously, the, the rockets seem to ride these, these torch-like flames, and they go, uh, they go up. They, they actually can accelerate straight up. So against the pull of gravity and everything like that, they just nonetheless can go up. They can go supersonic straight up. They can just blast their way up there. Anyway, uh, the flame only touches the ground initially, which should give you sort of a, a, an inkling that mm, the ground didn't matter all that much. And that's true. Um, furthermore, the rockets don't even need air to push against. They, push, they can operate perfectly well in empty space. And there's a piece I keep putting in the book about, uh, from the New York Times in the 1920s, talking about how, what, a, what a fool this guy Robert Goddard was for thinking you could operate a rocket in empty space where there's nothing to push against. Well, the New York Times was wrong. Uh, in empty space, there is something to push against. You carry it on board, it's called fuel. You push, the rocket pushes on its own fuel. The fuel's gone forever after the push, but that's okay. If you push the fuel to your left, the fuel pushes you to the right. And that's how a rocket goes. So what pushes a rocket for? That's the question. And it turns out it's the fuel itself. So to show you this, you know, first the, this simple and not very effective demonstration, but it gives you the, mostly the background. The, the issue is this cart is simply not, doesn't move easily enough for this demonstration to work well. But here I am, uh, I am a rock, I'm a, I, I, we're, we're together a rocket ship. This is a big ball of fuel, all assembled, ready for launch. Our total momentum right now is what? Zero. When our velocity is zero, mass is significant, more than we'd like maybe, but we've got no velocity. I'm going to redistribute the momentum by giving the ball some momentum to the left. I'm going to end up with momentum to the right, but together we're going to end up, as we started, with zero momentum as a total. So here we go. I'm moving, right? <laughs> really cooking. Well, I, I, that was rocket propulsion. By pushing on that stuff, which took away momentum to the left, I ended up with a deficit of momentum to the left, namely momentum to the right. If I were able to throw the ball faster so it took away more momentum with it, or if I had more balls to keep throwing them, I could go faster and faster. So the issue with a rocket, and this is how rockets work, is they try to, to, to throw whatever stuff they've got, and it's precious. They only have so much mass to start with. They try to take what mass they've got available and throw it as fast as they possibly can one way. And the act of pushing on it and thereby transferring momentum to it, remember impulse, force times time, causes the, the, the fuel stuff to push on them for force times time and give them momentum in the opposite direction. So the rocket, in principle, starts with zero momentum. It ends up, in principle, with zero momentum, neglecting gravity, which is really not an important story, part of the story. You start with no momentum, you end up with no momentum. But it's distributed funny in the form of fuel, maybe burned, but still the fuel, going one way like crazy, and the ship, what's left, going the other way like crazy. Questions about that idea? That's the rocket propulsion concept. You don't have to push on something outside the, the ship. You push on your own store of fuel. So having done that, let's push on our own store of fuel. So water rockets, the, the, 
you need an energy source to do the to, to, to provide the energy to make this stuff work. And this guy is powered by compressed air, but the fuel that it throws out isn't air. Air doesn't have enough mass, so you can't you can't push hard enough on it to, to get enough momentum into it. So this pushes on water instead. So this guy, I will put the energy in. The water is already there. I think it says pump, pump three times, which means pump ten times. <laughs> Why stop? Woo! <laughs> yeah. You can try this after class, right? So that's one. And, and just make sure the concept's clear. The water, the compressed air pushed the water downward. And the water pushed the compressed air and the rocket upward. Action, reaction, Newton's third law. And so the water came blasting down here with downward momentum and the rocket ended up with upward momentum. Off it goes, okay? Second one. And this one needs a volunteer. Anybody else? Anybody else? Jewel. Ellie, I'll let you do the second trip. This is a carbon dioxide fire extinguisher. They are normally designed to send the gas out sideways and then into a collector and, and onto the fire. This one has been sawed off, so it will send all the carbon dioxide gas that way as fast as possible, which is hundreds of miles an hour. Okay? So the gas will go this way, having been pushed to hundreds of miles an hour toward your left, the gas will push back on, the, on the, this thing and on Jewel, and she will accelerate toward the right. Okay? Okay. Have a seat. <laughs> yeah, you know what you volunteered for. <laughs> so ha so have, have a seat with your feet up. Facing which way? You, you want to face that, that yeah. way, because that's, wh that's what you're gonna, where you're going to head. And you have to get your feet up, okay? okay. And now reach behind you <laughs> and squeeze these two, ha the handle together tightly when I, you know, not yet, but <laughs> get ready. And you'll pick up speed, and then at the end, get ready to stop yourself, okay? You're free to go. <laughs> Yay, thank you. <laughs> Matt, you want to try the second trip? Okay. After class, there's a second trip in this guy for sure, okay? Easily. So we can come and try it. One more rocket, though. Okay. This one, a bottle with a hole drilled in the cap. Rocket fuel. It's called L Lamar Vita, ultra hold hairspray. I think that's about enough. About about a one second dose. Let it evaporate. <laughs> Ready? Oh come on. <laughs> Yes! It's back. <laughs> Out with the bad air, in with the good. You wanted to see it again, didn't you? So the same idea. This one is really air powered, or burned air powered. It's shooting a plume of burned gas out toward me, which requires a hard push. And the gas that's coming out pushes back on what's left inside the, con the container and the bottle and propels it up there. So it's, this, it's a real rocket I and mean, it's following the real rules. It's using materials that were all on board before launch. There we go. Oh, get in there. Hopefully I cleared out enough of the air. It's sometimes a little problematic on the second trip. There was also one time when the the lid blew off and hit the guy who was launching it, who was a diver over at the AFC, hit him in the shoulder. And he had, you know, we were diving, he had this lovely purple welt for a week. Ready? Oh, come on. <laughs> yeah, more's better. This is actually one of those cases where more is not necessarily better. Sometimes it just gets 
More dud. Okay, try again. Yes! All right. So that's, so that's most of the story with rockets. We've got more to do. <laughs> yeah. You're welcome to come up now after class and play with the rockets. We'll continue on Friday for those.